Okay, so I'll I'll just give you a brief story of the origin. So from our British curriculum, Nigeria was colonized by the British and we had this educational system brought to us. So when I was a kid, this teacher we do have then and then she will come to say, Oh, hi everyone, nice nice to have you back from the holiday. Can you write a letter? to your uncle in the abroad this or that or telling him how you spent your holiday that was how it started so the old fishing meal the old fishing meal thing welcome to cybersecurity heroes an iron skills podcast about you the heroes of cybersecurity You're about to hear and learn practical and experiential knowledge in our conversations with CISOs, security directors and architects, SOC analysts, and other InfoSec stars so we can become more cyber resilient and safer together. Let's get into the show. Welcome to Cybersecurity Heroes. I'm your host for today's episode, Brendan Rudd, Community Director at Ironscales, an email security platform powered by AI, enhanced by thousands of customer security teams, and built around detecting and removing threats in the inbox. We offer a service that is fast to deploy, easy to operate, and is unparalleled in the ability to stop all types of email threats, including advanced attacks like business email compromise, account takeover, and more. Thanks for tuning in. Let's get into the show. Hey, Mayoku. Welcome to the show. Hi, Brandon. Thanks for having me here. Yeah, thank you for taking the time to join us today. I'm excited to chat with you about your experience and what's going on in Nigeria specifically. We haven't had many guests from Nigeria or Africa, except for myself as the host, obviously. But before we get into the show, could you tell us a little bit about you, your background and what you're up to these days? Oh, yeah, yeah. A little bit about myself. My name is Daini Adimayoko. I'm a cybersecurity specialist with MTN Nigeria. I've worked with Cyber Soccer Africa. I started my career, there, my cybersecurity career with Cyber Soccer Africa. Yeah, I grew through the ranks from level two, to be precise. And I deal with same activities. I work with incident response. I do digital forensics. I do volatility management. And yeah little bit of penetration testing in the sense that I have read and have practicalized on a very shallow aspect because the SOC is majorly a defensive place, except there's a there's a special request for penetration. It's fine. Application security, yes. I've worked in security, compliance, I review policies, and yes, here I am, here with Brandon. So I think that's an achievement. Thank you for the intro. So you mentioned CyberSOC. Can you tell us a little bit about this organization and what they're about and how you got into CyberSoc? So CyberSoc Africa is an organization, we, it's a SOC, it's an MSSP, Managed Security Service Provider. They, they are one of the largest in West Africa. So they are majorly the only SOC that does training for entry levels in Nigeria for now. Everybody just put out a job opening with at least two years experience, two years experience. Nobody cares. But Cyber South Africa will take you regardless of your foundation. My colleagues where I studied biochemistry, anatomy, media in the medical line, but then we ended up in the same place. So yeah, Cyber South trained us to be who we are today and we are in different organizations setting the standards. So yes, Cyber South will groom you from the start and then of course, you also have to be eager to learn and able to grow in the environment. You have all the resources you need to learn. Just take it at a time and practice and understand and know how to work with it. Yes, so Sabato gives you that platform to express yourself, to enjoy yourself and to learn. Would you say that this culture of giving people a chance is inherent of the Nigerian culture? Because you also mentioned that CyberSoc was founded in Israel, correct? Yes, but uh, it's founded in Israel, and they, but they have their headquarters here in Nigeria because um, they operate majorly in Africa for now. So would you say that this culture of giving people a chance, it's the Nigerian culture, the company culture, or a mix of both? 
it's a mix of both in such a way that it's we are just few in the cyber security industry in Nigeria. So one can barely easy barely mention socks that we have that are up to standard that provides the standard service that is that an organization needs in proper security environment. And in other industries, the yeah, Nigerian culture comes first because yeah, you have to learn to do some things before you can go ahead to perform some other activities. But then in the cybersecurity industry, yeah, this is the first of its kind. Would you say that there is a big presence of Israeli cybersecurity collaboration in Nigeria? Is it a growing collaboration between Nigeria or other African countries? So in the last few years, as much connections with them and they are currently in Africa. I have a cyber sock and I think there are just two socks in Nigeria and that has an Israeli connect. However, the major SOC, Cyber SOC Africa, is consists of Nigerian trained SOC analysts. They are the ones that do the work. They do the job and they are being trained with the Israeli curriculum. And how did you get into cybersecurity? Oh, yeah. So on this fateful day, I, I was just going about to do my normal game development. Yeah. Because I was writing code before a game developer, which I tried to do later. But then I was in class, I was training some students, and a cousin of mine reached out, oh, there's an internship going on, CyberSoc is getting, is training people that are interested and have vision. I said, okay, put in my application. And then I was called upon. So I went for the interview, the whole training, the whole interview process, the Assessment lasted the whole day. We had to do practical, from practical to theory, from theory to cognitive assessment. And then we had little breaks in between. And then the oral interview also, where we have the CTO, Yanni Bovit, sitting down with you one-on-one -on -one and understanding you to see how you fit into the organization. Yeah, I was part of the lucky ones because um, I think that year we had about, we had over 200 applicants and we only picked 15. So I got in and I did three months of training, hands-on and theory every day. I mean, every day of the week, every working day. And Monday to Friday, we have classes. And at the end of the week, we have assessments. So the assessment to determine if you are resuming on Monday, because you have to know what was taught last week, in the previous week. So the assessment to determine if you are eligible to be in the next stage of the training. So that was what so strenuous. I enjoyed it. Why? I'm also someone that likes to be challenged. So I saw it as a challenge and I picked it. And yeah, I survived <laughs> three months. <laughs> three months, yeah. And I was working as a printer. Then after a while, due to performance and some other criteria were promoted to its own analysis. So are are you saying that once you got the job, you actually had to go through three months of training before you could actually start working? No, you have to go through the training before you get the job. Okay, so it's like your first stage. You've been verbally offered the job, but you have to pass the training first. Yes. So in the cybersecurity industry is more like we do with confidential data, and we deal with resources that you don't want everybody to know about. So you wouldn't want anyone to come in and easily just go out. So they put everybody in a, in a closed environment where you learn the stuff, you learn it with lab environments, you learn the solutions, you know how to work with them. So that when you come on the job. Now, if you don't perform well from the classes, from the training, there is no way to... There's no way you can get the job. You can't be in the SOC because it's a closed environment. It's not accessible to everyone. So it's only if you're an, an entry-level candidate. Obviously, if you're coming with experience, you skip the training. It's only for the entry-level positions. Yes. Um, experienced hires also go to training because they basically or they probably haven't worked with some of the solutions that we work with and they are not aware of the processes and procedures in this. So what we do is we know for experienced hires, and then they just have to come with their experience. We tell them these are the tools, we do security awareness, we tell them the policies and procedures that we have, and we show them to their team leads. So the team leads also 
we do is on assessment to test the weakness and strength of the experienced hire the job is already gotten so the team lead is the one that will assess that will know the type of training to administer to such hire to say okay because you've worked with this before you've done this before i think you should try this this should not be too hard for you or you understand me so i think you should try this work with this let's see how it goes so apply the knowledge you have with this solution apply it to this other solution let's see how it goes so that's how it works and what would you say is the biggest challenge you've faced in cybersecurity? I think the biggest challenge is when I basically don't have anything to work on. Because sometimes there's this period where you just feel like there's nothing to work on. And I feel like something is happening somewhere, but I'm not aware. So that's my greatest challenge. So I have to start looking around. And that's when I conduct, um, I just dive into the EDRs, I do straight up threat hunting and find something that is out of the norm to get for myself and also to learn from. And then one of the greatest challenges I had was was facing um, the review ransomware and with a team. I it wasn't easy, of course. And then we had to do what we had to do. How how much has ransomware affected companies in Nigeria? Oh, it has been around. Depends on the company that reports because not everybody will want to open up about the attacks that they receive. However, the ones I'm aware of, like three this year. So are you saying it's not required to report breaches in Nigeria? Well, it is important to report breaches depending on the, the professional body of that particular industry. If it's a bank, there's a regulation for that. If, if it's a pharmacy... Is a regulation for that. So all policies depends on the industry specifically. I know that the banks report their breaches to the Central Bank of Nigeria, which they now do a central publication for that. I mean, publication for that. But then other industries, because they are more of SMEs, a lot, a small, medium enterprise, they just forfeit the fact that, oh, you just crash the system. We can't afford it, of course, because they are just more businesses and the solutions that the cybersecurity solutions are a lot. They cost more than the company itself. So they just forfeit and just close it up and then get new systems or start afresh. They can afford that. It's more like a risk acceptance. So speaking of ransomware, what else keeps you up at night? What else keeps me up at night? Uh, poverty. The fear of being poor. I I don't want to be poor and I don't want to get poor. Not like I'm poor though, but I'm comfortable. However, I strive to get better. I need to have knowledge in various aspects. I need to understand some things and learning has to continue. I need to be up to standard. I don't look at being a standard cybersecurity expert in Nigeria. I'm looking at the global level. I want to be able to stand up when of course, I get to the US, they say, oh, this is a cybersecurity analyst. I can raise up my hand. I get to the UK, cybersecurity analyst. I can raise up my hand. In the global, I'm looking up to the global standard and not just Nigeria alone. So that keeps me up at night. Would you say that cybersecurity is underpaid in Nigeria as a profession? Yes, I can say it's underpaid depending on the role and the years of experience. Why? Because at the moment, yeah, the economy of Nigeria is not on the same level with uh, the economy in the U.S. or the U.K. So uh, we can't really compare the salary or the um, benefits from each from different countries. However, in Nigeria, yeah, the industries they are trying their best. Of course, they know that it's not easy and talents are scarce. You can't, if you have a talent, you do just want to let the talent go. So you have to make them comfortable when you can. And for me personally, I can tell you that it's the, with the richest company win at the moment, those with the higher budget. Why? Because it is who has the money that pays the piper or who plays the piper that takes the tune. So if you have the money, you hire a talent comes and do the work and then you can afford them. So the level, the analyst can grow to say, okay, it's like, I, I can't do this anymore. I, do, I don't feel comfortable unless I get paid more. If that doesn't work, the company will part. If it works, they increase the money. It's, it's basically finance issues. The, 
salary is on the average. I can't say it's poor. I can't say it's good. Would you say since the pandemic, there has been more opportunities for the cybersecurity folks in Nigeria to work remotely abroad? I think that's a major issue which I've been battling with. Yes, due to the pandemic, there's a, a lot of opportunities around the world. However, there seems to be a special, I mean, bad habit of excluding Nigerians from applications. I don't know why. But then I also understand some of the employment laws that states that you can't easily just move someone from outside the country. You have to prove that someone in your country do the work that person can do like that. And the person also has to meet some requirements where you have to be residential for a while before you can get the SE clearance like that, etc. But then I feel there should just be an open mind to these talents. I have colleagues, I have I have colleagues that have brought down that, that, that brought down industries why because of their talent and penetration testing activity. I I see them being on the standard of the global level and then we see a job opportunity outside the country and what you have been told is that because you're in Nigeria and you can apply. You can go ahead to do the background screening if you want to, but don't just take a look at what you are. don't judge the book by the cover. Cybersecurity Heroes is brought to you by Iron Scales, an AI-powered self-learning email security platform that helps security professionals proactively prevent, detect, and remediate phishing attacks in a matter of seconds, not hours or days. And we have an exclusive offer for our podcast listeners. Discover dormant phishing threats in your organization's mailboxes. Get a free 90-day scan back with a detailed report. Integrate in seconds with two clicks via API to Microsoft Office 365 and see what your current email security is missing. Go to ironscales.com slash free scan to learn more. Do, do you think there is a stigma against Nigeria that kind of comes from back in the day when Nigeria had the reputation for being the birth country of email phishing? And I don't know, ha has Nigeria changed its perception over the years? Okay, so... I'll, I'll just give you a brief story of the origin. So from our British curriculum, Nigeria was colonized by the British and we had this educational system brought to us. So when I was a kid, this teacher we do have then, and then she will come to say, oh, hi everyone, nice, nice to have you back from the holiday. Can you write a letter to your uncle in the abroad, this or that, or telling him how you spent your holiday? That was how it started. So the old fishing meal, the old fishing meal thing, I feel everyone is a source. I have also received fishing meals as a Nigerian. So, and then I didn't even know what it was. Now, I still have fishing meals pending that I filter the way. Why? Because it's inevitable. Everyone will receive it at this point in time. It's not only Nigeria that sent fishing meals. I've been in the soccer attacks from Russia, toy tunnels from Netherlands, ETC, even the US, a lot. So I think is that the British or the US, those that bring out the stigma that propagates it, I think they are being challenged. They feel challenged or uh, they feel, oh, the Nigerians are growing up to a standard where we can't oversee their activities. Why? Because they are learning these things. And the thing is, Nigerians learn the hard way. So if I know something, just know that I commit my heart to it. I finish, I will read it from the front to the end. So I finish everything. And that's how Nigerians learn. If you look at our educational system, it's one of the hardest in the world. I've seen job offers. I have I've seen LinkedIn posts where they post a job and they say Nigerians are not allowed to apply. And there are some that I've even applied to that my country, I get a rejection mail immediately. I'll tell you that Nigerians are one of the most hardworking individuals you ever meet. Anything they commit their heart to do, they do it. Because my grandma taught me anything worth doing, do it well to the latter. Yeah, give an average Nigerian food to eat, water to drink, and it to work with. Trust me, you get a lot of productivity. It's really interesting and thank you for sharing. I, I, I would like to delve deeper into this. Are you saying 
it's only Nigerians that are being discriminated against. Have you seen other countries being rejected in the small print? No, I have not seen any country rejected. However, there are other postings that state that, oh, due to location, and there's a reason for excluding such countries, the countries, the region from applying, why maybe they need someone in Texas alone. But then they, you open a job, you put a job opening out, everyone can apply, I say, and at the bottom you put notes, Nigerians are not allowed. Or I create my profile and boom, I set up my work contract and then I click Nigerian and then the red line comes from below. Yes, Nigerians are not allowed. That's interesting. I didn't know that. So sticking to this topic for a bit, what is the cybersecurity culture like in Nigeria? Can you talk to that a little bit? Cybersecurity culture in Nigeria. Mostly from my end, I've been in the so-called true. Uh, I've been, it's more of a techie environment. We run shifts, yeah, 24 by 7 activity. So yeah, the culture is good. It's almost the same in every other country. I've seen some job descriptions in the UK say stating, must be able to run 24 by 7 shifts. I've done 12 hour shifts before. I've done 24 hour shifts. Why? Because pandemic came. Of course, I needed to rest. But then if my colleagues can't come in, I have to come in to do the job. So a little bit of rest, I'm back. A little bit of rest, I'm back. I shuffled it with my fellow colleagues on shift. It was good. It's not as if there was something. Of course, the body will feel it later. But then you still have to get the job done. And... That's the typical mentality of a Nigerian. Get the job done and get paid. The culture is open. We do have meetups from time to time. We share sessions. And also, myself and my colleagues, those of us that did training together and we worked together in Sabaso before we went to our various other destinations after a while, we still have a group chat where we communicate. And we also share knowledge, not only for fun. We share knowledge, we share things that... We work with, oh, I've worked with this guy. It works well. It's, however, it takes resources. So the culture is still is still open. What is a misconception in cybersecurity in Africa that you can speak to? Yeah, let's see. From my experience, I've applied to some companies in the UK and I was opportunity for some interviews. And they come to the interview looking like, definitely doesn't know anything about what he's talking about. So they actually don't take it serious. And they just see it as, oh, let's just wait a little time. Let's see how it goes. But then the there was an interview I engaged in, I think, with one company in Newcastle. And the HR, the person that reached out to me, was he was shocked with some things I mentioned. I was like, you, you do this. Why can't you just let me it the way I can do it. Why, why are you telling? Why are you asking me if I can do what I said I can do? If there's need for that, you can just put in a technical assessment. I mean to put it through, but no one is saying anything. And he was he was shocked when I told him, "Oh, I've worked with AdSite, I worked with Curator, I worked with Alien Vault." So it, it was more like they are not serious, or they just underrate the Nigerian industry, of which we are all striving to be on the global standard. Nobody is perfect, and there is growth. So, yes, everyone is growing and there will be a point where we stand and in Sakana from the UK. We'll be together and there will be no difference. So you, you're saying that there is a discrimination against people from Africa, maybe because it's the color of your skin that you're not capable of uh, using the tools and being trustworthy of what you say you can do. That's what you're saying? Yeah, I think the trust issues, yeah. Trust issues. Of course, um, if I have an organization, I bring in some in, a new employee. I can't trust him with all the things I have. Why? Because I don't know his full intentions. I don't know. I've not tested him. I've not seen him. However, there's there's a, a thin line to some things, and you should be able to tolerate this guy or this person because you are from two different backgrounds, and you need to get to understand that person, how the person express things. Now, if the person doesn't know how to do the job, it's a different thing. But when the person is trying to explain himself, trying to tell you what he can do, and you are just looking at it like, why are you lying? Why are you telling lies? It's just 
it's not something you are sure about, but you've already made up your mind that, oh, this guy, he doesn't know. And you are not going to come open-minded to understand whatever he's saying. You are just coming to catch from Then there's something wrong with that. Yeah, I'm sorry for that experience, but hopefully you'll have better ones uh, in the future. And luckily you're in a you're in a good place right now. So I guess it was meant to be. So w- what would you say from your personal opinion is something that you, you know, passionately disagree with regarding cybersecurity practices or the industry other than what you may have mentioned before? I think the aspect of an entry level or you are hiring a SOC analyst and then you're asking for two years experience. If you want entry level, look for entry level and put them in a training school. Or if you want experienced hire, you should be able to satisfy or open your budget up to accommodate the experienced hire. Don't come looking for an experienced hire for an entry level position. It doesn't make sense. I know what I would have done in my two years. I know what I did in the last two years as a stock analyst. So it's not, and that's where most organizations even locally and globally, I believe it's everywhere. Why? Because it's a game of numbers. If you have a budget for something, if you, the talents are small and I have the opportunities are also a little bit smaller. So anyone with the best opportunity, you are looking at some someone in the market where there is no job or the job openings are very low, not everybody are qualified and then you get an offer but you don't like it. I know how many offers are rejected here in Nigeria because they try to make it look like I was begging for the job or they try to put me in a tight corner. So, and I believe he doesn't want to play the politics. If I can pay less, why pay more? That's it, but I think there should be a fair or there should be a straight line to define things. There should be structure. If you want the experienced hire, you get the experienced hire. You afford him, set your budget to it. If you want an entry level, oh, you will know that, okay, you'll be spending money on training and, and should be able to accommodate the person also and not look for an experience diet for an entry level it doesn't make sense yeah it's definitely a contentious topic and it's not the first time we hear it so it's definitely a global issue right now which hopefully will change in the near future speaking of future where do you think cybersecurity in nigeria will be in the next five to ten years Next five to ten years, I will start with the global umbrella, which is information technology. The global umbrella of technology. I believe that in the next five to ten years, every pleasant industry in Nigeria or in Africa will be up to standard in technology. I mean, bankers will be able to write code, farmers will be able to write their own blogs with primary coding abilities, and they learn the technology because right now. We have outlets in Nigeria, yeah. Many outlets where we train people, we train kids, we train even adults on basic coding languages, C sharp, C plus, JavaScript, Java, like that, etc. But then in the cybersecurity industry, the growth is also coming, whereby everyone is diving towards the future, which is cybersecurity and artificial intelligence in conjunction with machine learning and my mentor used to say something. You don't wait for the future to come to you. You work ahead so that when the future captures, catches up with you, you are able to checkmate it. And that was when he did a course with Harvard on machine learning. He is currently out of the country. I believe he will soon come back. But yeah, he, he has taught me a lot and I learned a lot from him. So the industry in the next five to 10 years will be filled with a lot of tech-savvy people and also, we have a larger cybersecurity firm. We have industries that in will invest more, that we push to invest more in cybersecurity, and also invest in talents. And talent will be scarce, and then the industry will be up to standard, up to the global standard that we want it to be. Yeah, thank you so much, Mayoku. It's been really fascinating to hear your stories and your experience, and especially to learn a bit more about Nigeria. Before we close out today's episode, is there anything else you think we've missed that you would like to touch on? I would like to inform bodies, if you have the opportunity to work with someone in Nigeria, you can take it or give it a try. And let's see how it goes. Don't just shut us out and expect us to be fine with it. 
if we like it or not, those are the that motivate most of us because we also want to get to that level of shutting people out. And if it gets there, then you, we are no longer making the world a better place. We are just basically going with the flow, which is not supposed to be. We need to be able to make a better place for ourselves and let the diversity continue. Well, I'm glad we could share your story and your insights and your experience today. So hopefully this will be the first of many uh, changes to come in the, the near future. But thank you so much again for taking the time today. If anybody would like to reach out to you, get in touch, what's the best way for them to connect with you? Primarily at the moment in Nigeria, so in the Twitter, primarily on LinkedIn, you can reach me at the Mayo Kundaini and I'll be sure to respond, of course. Great. So we'll be sure to put those in the show notes. So again, thanks everyone. And thank you, Mayoku, for taking the time to join us today on Cybersecurity Heroes. And until next time, we'll see you then. Thank you, Brandon. That's a wrap for this episode of Cybersecurity Heroes, practical and experiential knowledge on a day in the life of security heroes. Catch our next episode by subscribing through your favorite podcast platform. If you're listening in Apple Podcasts, please leave a rating for the show. They really help a lot. Thank you so much for listening. Until next time.